Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on our show. We may or may not call this the Bill and Wendy show now. <laughs> so we're, we're still in our naming phase, but thanks for joining us. We try to bring education and real estate investing, passive income types of real estate investing type of education. I, I have to constantly remind myself to do this, but we have archived episodes that are going to be somewhere, depending on what device or platform you're watching this from, it's either going to be below or one of the sides, you click on any of those and watch any of the archive videos that we've already done. And please don't forget to like and share and recommend our show to, to others. So I, I am pleased to, to today to have Mike Schlotnick, a really good friend of ours. The guy is amazing. He is really a trained mathematician and he loves real estate investing. We get a lot of our advice from, from Mike. We use most of it. <laughs> we also like to be a little independent as well. Wonderful guy. He just launched his second fund. Is that correct, Mike? New fund, yes called yeah. Tempo Growth Fund. So it's a Tempo Growth Fund, and we're going to talk about his fund and, and the, the type of investments that are, are going into this fund. And Mike always likes to talk about the adjusted risk in funds, and uh, we're going to get a little deeper dive into this. But before we start, Mike, why don't you uh, give us a little bit of uh, background on who you are, how you got started, what you love to do. I know one of the things you love to do is hang out and arenas and watch your daughter ice skate. Thank you, Billy. It's a privilege to be on your podcast. Love working with you and Wendy and certainly appreciate uh, you. Originally, I come from Russia with love, like in the movie, but I came from what used to be the former Soviet Union. Uh, I ran away from communism, socialist, and happy to be a U.S. citizen and big supporter of this country and love this country. This is my country. This was 89 when I came over. I had a career and I have an education as a mathematician. I had a career in software development, went pretty high up. Then I was just sick and tired of it. I was very successful and my passion has always been real estate. I've been investing in real estate since 2000 and I went real estate full time 2009. Running the first fund. So we've, we've had fund management since 2009 until now. We launched uh, our newest Tempo Grow Fund, our flagship fund today is Tempo Opportunity Fund. Certainly love the space, this is my passion. As they say, find three things, things you like, think, things, things you're good at, and th things that make you money. Th that's, that's sort of the golden middle. So that's what I do. Family-wise, I have uh, married over 20 years, four kids and a cat. And my kids ice skate a lot, and that's why you hear that I am often at the ice skating rinks. And if people ask me if I, if I ice skate personally, uh, my answer is, have you ever been to circus? Well, you ever seen bears on ice? That's me. <laughs> but my kids do a little bit better than that. Let me put it this way. Well, we know you're much more coordinated than a bear on, on ice, but you are as big as a bear sometimes. <laughs> yeah, and that's the whole brand, Big Mike, bigmikefun.com. That's my brand because I'm a big guy and, and uh, some of the best friends recommend it. That's the brand I should have. So, And you're in the uh, Brooklyn area, correct? That's right. I live in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, we invest all over the country. Billy, your fund is an income fund. So we certainly love the space. We love the income space, but we also operate in the growth space and growth and income space. So we take advantage of the best opportunities in whatever space they are, there are. But our whole model, and, and I think your model is very similar, is relationship driven. We do business only with people who we know, like, and trust. Right. So you have a great income fund. We believe we have great growth and growth and income funds. Sort of, you could do mixed strategies, you could do a focus strategy. All these things make sense. And I think they make sense even more today when the stock market is doing so well, it's at the peak. We just never know when the music is going to stop. And sure. when it stops, it can stop pretty hard. So I'm not advocating the you know collapse of a stock market but it's been so over performing overpriced it needs to revert to the mean so one of the basic concepts is as folks continue to do well in the stock market they should consider the fact that the music may stop one of these days sure and those who enter now can 
not enjoy the, the, the ride for the next 10 years. So that's. Well, I mean, you know, the old saying, you know, you're supposed to buy low and sell high, but most of the time people are, you know, buying high and selling low because they're afraid of missing out on something and they always buy at the peak of the market. That, that, that's the usual the conversation. Professionals do it the right way, but the general public tends to be the, the, the whipping boy, as it were, they get in because they, they finally hear that it's going so great. I, I think I, I mentioned this in a previous episode that stocks are the only thing that when the, the only product that when it goes on sale, people run screaming out of the stores instead of buying them up. <laughs> That's right. Because people don't think genuine value investing. Most people are momentum investors. If things are going up, that's when they come in and buy. And when they've really gone up and they feel, hey, this thing will continue running, they don't realize that they are overpaying so much more for the assets that they are acquiring. And stocks are assets in essence. So sure. the, the primary issue with stock market is, well, the primary benefit is very liquid. It's one of the things that why people love stock market. You could click a button and it's easy. Right. The primary concern is lack of predictability. It's been running really well, but the assets are overpriced. People are paying way too much. And I, I don't want, want to sort of us to focus on this discussion, but it's certainly a consideration for people who think it's been great, going great. That this is the time to be very, very mindful. This is the time to be cautious. And a black swan event could trigger quick and sudden correction. As we see some volatility related to the coronavirus, coronavirus can, in fact, right. trigger, could be a black swan event. So everything is good until the, it's not. And that, that's the key point here. So Yeah, and, and it tends to be, even though there's people are looking at the fundamentals, it tends to be emotion-driven. Whereas uh, the reason we love the real estate space, uh, one of them is it's really a hedge against itself. You have the opportunity to buy low and sell high in, in, in assets related to real estate. At the same time, if the underlying value now declines, you still have an income component to it. So it's, it's kind of, to me, it's kind of like a stock that pays dividends. Sometimes the dividends are higher and the growth is lower. Sometimes the growth is higher and the dividends are a little bit lower. Predictable. That's one yeah. word that describes real estate. You have a lot more predictability, especially when you control the price you, you get in, what you're paying for an asset and the income you project to get. If you do, you underwriting conservatively, you have a lot more predictable outcome versus a very speculative outcome in a stock market. If you catch the right wave, you do very well. If you catch the wrong wave, you... people don't remember the pain points. They, well, people remember the pain points. They just want to, don't want to talk about it. <laughs> you wipe it from their memory because it's so tragic. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about the, the new fund, the Tempo Growth Fund. Uh, what kind of assets are you looking at? Uh, I know you just launched it and you're, you're looking for in investors now. Tell me a little bit about the fund itself. Sure. So we already have a few initial investments in the fund and we continue to find great opportunities. So this is a growth fund. Contrast to our growth and income fund, it does not have initial distributions. It's a long-term fund. It's got five to seven year horizon. We're raising capital between 12 to 24 months. At that point, we'll close the fund. And we're investing in, I don't know if you follow my methodology with all the, all the investment quadrants, but we have, we have, folks can, can go on our website and just sort of take a look. So if you imagine four quadrants, as a well-known, you know, Robert Kiyosaki talks about quadrants. My quadrants are a little different. You have quadrant one, two, three, four. So quadrants one, two are investment grade, kind of defensive. They have good downside protection. Quadrant three and four are speculative. And quadrant one and three are cash flow in quadrants and quadrant one and three are cash flow and two and four growth. So we are, as much as we can, we're investing in quadrant two deals. So I'll give you some examples. So we like distressed commercial paper here in New York City. So we would buy or participate in a deal where the underlying asset is a mortgage, is a first lien mortgage secured by a property at a low LTV or investment to value ratio. So here's an example, and we've already invested a million bucks in this particular sector is the first, one of the first investments. So think of it this way. I'll give you an example of a project that we invested in the past and give you a quick life cycle of how it works. So 
there was an acquisition of an eight million dollar commercial first lien mortgage uh, secured by 27 newly built contiguous family houses in Queens, College Point, Queens, New York. That portfolio was easily worth 20, 22 million if you close your eyes and you discount it heavily because these, these houses traded a million dollars a piece, if not more. So the collateral was very strong, say 20 million, but it's more than that. And I know it was like only 8 million. When you buy that, you are at 40% loan to value ratio. It's extremely low risk, a very strong downside protection. And what's the upside on that? Well, the upside is default interest and late fees. So as a lender, you do a lot of lending. You don't want the paper to default. You're happy to collect interest rate. But what do you normally collect in performing paper? 10, 11, 12%. I mean, that's, that's the market today. Right. But on defaulted paper, it's 24%. Very, very typical here in New York. Generally between 18 and 24%, uh, more typically 24%. That particular deal had 24% default interest rate and they had 6% late charge. So the late charge is an instant kick on the uh, kick up. So you collect it immediately the moment it goes default. And then you collect 24% until you're repaid. So a deal like this can, has almost no, no room to go down at that low LTV and all the upside to accrue at 24%. So you are making very strong risk adjusted return. You heard me speak about that because of a very low LTV, the loss reserves on that kind of deal need to be low. Generally, when you're in a first lien paper, a conservative LTV, your loss reserves less than 1%, well, 1%, say. So if you're accumulating 24 and you put 1% in loss reserves, you're now at 23, maybe even 22 if you want to be conservative. So this is a very strong investment, but it doesn't have the cash flow until it, it, it repays. Foreclosure in New York is lengthy, and it's both its beauty and a curse. Beauty because you can, you can accumulate a lot of default interest. The curse because it takes a long time. Sure. So this asset class is just one of the investments we like. We did our invest, initial investment. We'll continue to take more positions than this because it's pretty defensive. And as long as you know how to take a, a property through the distress life cycle with foreclosure and workout as necessary, you could do really well. That's just one example. The next example, which I also like quite a bit, a value add multifamily. So if you can, if you know the right, and again, we are, I'm a fund manager. So my job is to find sponsors who are specialists in the right field and they have the right type of deals. So when we invest with the right sponsor and the right value add, you could get some cash flow or not, depending on what the project is doing. If it's doing a lot of renovations from start, first and second year could be pretty, you know, pretty low on the cash flow. But you're building a lot of improvements to the property, increasing rents and increasing value. So we like those type of assets, and generally these two will fall into quadrant two in my methodology. We do some quadrant four deals, which are development or redevelop redevelopment deals. For example, an old Macy's could get redeveloped into a self-storage facility. So that's a classic quadrant four deal because it's development or redevelopment. It's more speculative in nature. But the highest and best use of that asset is no longer a shopping, you know, a big box retailer like Macy's, but a self-storage facility. So those are a couple, a little bit of examples of what we invested. Yeah, and there's a lot of redevelopment going on along the, around the country, given some of the big box stores uh, really never, you know, they weren't able to turn on a dime. It's like trying to turn a cruise ship quickly. And some of them were over leveraged. Some of them just never changed their models to keep up with the, different demographics on how people are shopping and those properties are still valuable properties. They just have to be redeveloped into something that people are wanting. And yeah, you can make some really good money figuring out what the public is after because you're able to buy those properties for really pennies on the dollar. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. Uh, at times some of these old malls are, uh, are being bought for the price of the land because right. they are located well in the city, this land per acre. That's the whole price, you're getting the buildings for free per, per se. That's why redevelopment projects look attractive that you, you don't have to build a building, you just have to build internal partitions and change the, the layout. But the structure itself is a pretty solid structure. So we, we absolutely like those projects in the right location with the right sponsors, with the right financial dynamics, the right financials. They make a ton of sense. And that's another part of what the fund invests in. So we're pretty opportunistic into anything industrial, 
office, commercial, long as it's the right sponsor, the right project, and we see strong value at, we certainly, you know, always look at downside protection. Does the project have downside protection? What is it? And always compute risk adjusted return. That's the bottom line. I mean, that methodology is critical. When folks invest in these projects, they, they have to think about realistic return. And that, that is the risk adjusted return is the realistic return. I failed to mention this at the beginning. This is for educational purposes only, by the way. You need to read your PPM or prospectus before you get into any investment. There are risks involved in any investment. We all know that. And your mileage may vary. <laughs> what we're trying to do here on this show is just show you all the different opportunities that are around there. And we're not trying to sell any securities or, or any funds in general. We're just educating you on, on what's out there. Okay. So that said, how geographically diversified are you thinking you're going to be in this fund? Are you looking most areas of the country or just where the, are they going to be in, you know, the, the mid markets or the large markets or just wherever you can find the opportunity? So it's a great question. Generally mid market, we are a small fund and the opportunities we're participating in, generally speaking, raise capital anywhere from a few million dollars to 20, 30. I've seen a few, you know, larger ones, but it's, it's a mid market. It's considered to be actually a lower part of the mid market. Mid, mid market goes to up to, up to hundred million approximately. So it's certainly mid market, low part of the mid market. The reason this market is a, is a land of opportunities is the big boys don't play here. The big boys are generally playing in, in the high end of the mid market and, and institutional assets. So you're not competing with large amounts of money, although there are plenty of players in the space. Sure. But a lot of the business is done relationally. And that's the key answer to your question. We invest only with people who we know, like, and trust. We don't take any cold leads from the street. We're not interested in cold business. We have a strong network of existing movers and shakers, sponsors. We obviously, you and I go to the CG mastermind, but our network ex expands well beyond the CG. So we're looking for the deals with very experienced sponsors and operators who know what they're doing. They're specialists in their space. So we have connections, again, People who do multifamily in Midwest, that's all they do. That's, that's the value add. Midwest, that's their specialty. People who do, as I mentioned, distressed commercial debt in New York City. We have folks who do stuff in the South. We have strong connections to the, again, shopping. And the shopping sector is an interesting you know, discussion. We'll, 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 we'll go in depth. But we certainly have connections with uh, specialists who buy retail properties in the Southeast. And the whole Amazon effect or e-commerce effect continues to take a bigger, bigger hold on, on retail. But there are plenty of significant opportunities in the local strip malls, shopping centers, not big bucks, typically not the enclosed big malls that people still go to. Service-oriented retailers, service-oriented businesses, certain retailers gyms, doctor offices, all those things need to be somewhere and they need to be located conveniently to the housing. So these type of assets, we have specialists in that area too. Some of these projects, pretty interesting projects too. So it's really no specific geographic focus. We will go pretty much anywhere around the country. It's only US. If we have a strong sponsor and they have a good project in a good area, we have one of the CG guys we've invested with in the past, they do Georgia heavy value at multifamily. They have the crews, the capabilities. They're looking for deals in, in those areas because they want to be able to move the crews around and be able to execute these projects. Sure. So those are the considerations where the footprint is and, and how good they are. And if they know what they're doing, if they're able to solve all these value add problems or challenges and execute on that plan, that's the key to the success. It's not where in the country, it's who's doing it, can they get through the project, can they get through the plan in a reasonable time and within the, the cost and the budget. Excellent. So I'm talking with Mike Schlotnick, and I want to make sure I give you his information too. It's a bigmikefund.com, and then Mike also does a podcast, Big Mike Fund Fun podcast. podcast. And uh, he, he has a, a lot of great guests on there as well. More questions about us, you can reach us at uh, carolinahardmoney.com. 
So the income fund, is it a closed end fund or is it going to be an open ended fund? So it's another great question. So let me finish up on Tampa Grove Fund. Okay, Tampa, sure. Tampa Grove Fund is a closed ended fund. So we're going to raise money, as I said, for 24 months, run it for five to seven years, run assets through a life cycle, and then repay folks with the back end return. Most of the return will come in the form of capital gains, some income on the way. And that fund, again, in agreement with you, we're not promoting anything. I'm just giving a little bit of information. Uh, and folks, if they're interested, they should request the PPM. That's the only way they could they can consider the fund. The fund does have significant tax efficiency. We're planning to use no leverage in the fund. Good for, for IRAs, it, no UBIT. And it uh, leverage works both ways. In a growth fund, leverage is extremely dangerous. So we're not doing that. It will, when we're switching to the Tampa Opportunity Fund, that is a growth and income fund. And that's an open-ended fund. So we do effectively, what is an open-ended fund? We subscribe capital on a quarterly basis. You do the same thing with Carolina, your fund, with Carolina Hard Money. So quarterly basis, we subscribe, we redeem investors, and we focus roughly two-thirds of our investments are focused on income and about one-third on growth. So we mix it up, and the total return is generated roughly from two-thirds of income and one-third approximately growth uh, through appreciation capital gains. That's the Tampa Opportunity Fund. Well, with the uh, growth fund, are your investors able to get some of the depreciation passed through along the way? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Again, we will pass through depreciation to whatever extent we'll get them on individual projects. So it works the same way you bought a building where you're developing or redeveloping a building. During the value add uh, phase of the project, generally speaking, Renovations are capitalized. There's some expenses that pass through as losses that actually go to, they, they pass to the fund and the fund passes it all the way to the investors to the fund. So in the K1, it looks like you're, you're losing money on paper in the first few years. In addition to the operating losses, you're also going to get depreciation benefits as value add part of the or rehab or renovations complete. Depreciation starts clicking in based on normal depreciation schedule, possibly some accelerated depreciation. So all this stuff will pass through. To whatever extent folks can use it for their tax benefit, great. If they can, they just carry forward. And on the back end, that is targeted to generate the best type of income is a long-term capital gain income. And of course, it'll get offset by the whatever operating losses that took place to get that. Yeah, so that's the benefit there. You're not getting any income during the, uh, the period that the, the fund is locked down. However, you're going to be able to get... Uh, operating losses on a K-1, you're going to get depreciation, which is also going to lower that tax burden. And then you've got the long-term capital gain versus the short-term capital gain at the end when you do get your profit. Now, if you're investing in an IRA, you're not really concerned about the capital gain, but you're not going to be able to take advantage of the losses. Uh, That's right. One quick comment on the losses. So generally, these losses will pass through as passive allocation losses. They're called PALS. Mm -hmm. And there's an expression, if you have a whole bunch of pals, what do you need? You need a lot of pigs, <laughs> passive investment gains. So that's the general methodology. Right. You're going to get these passive losses. If you are an active real estate investor, you could deduct them against your active income. But if you are passive, you cannot. You need the, the pigs. You need the passive investment gains to offset. Otherwise, it's just carry forward passively. Yeah, see, that's why Mike is the mathematician. And I'm just the host of the show, <laughs> but it's still tax advantage. You just have to be in the right position. And again, this is something that's going to be covered in the, in the PPM. And then as well as your tax advisor uh, would be able to help you with these uh, different options as well. The, one of the great benefits of in investing with an IRA is that it's not being leveraged and it's not a business, you're not operating a business, so there's no uh, UBIT tax that you have to worry about. And like I said, at the end, when you do get your gains, it's, uh, you know, you're, depending on what your, your tool is, it's either gonna be tax exempt or tax deferred. Yeah, it's a great point. We have no leverage in both funds, neither Tampa Opportunity Fund nor Tampa Growth Fund, and we intend to keep it that way. We're allowed for technical leverage, but it's case of emergency only. Uh, if we have liquidity crisis and stuff like that, but we're not using it for any practical, not to magnify the return. 
Right. The issues are with the IRS. They don't want it to magnify the returns or, or make it look like your hundred thousand dollar IRA is now a two hundred thousand dollar IRA because you use leverage to increase that value. That's right. That's that's the, the primary reason of the UBIT. The leverage is what they they consider unrelated business, and and the income related to the leverage is subject to UBIT. But we don't use it. And the side benefit of this uh, uh, IRA focus is the fact that it creates it makes the fund more conservative. It, it, the leverage works both ways. When things are running great, that's great. But when the things are running bad, the leverage is going to cause the grief. So we have no plans for a leverage, and especially in this market, I would caution folks to be very prudent with leverage. So, Well, you know, Mike and I have had this discussion before. L- leverage is not just a problem with uh, the unrelated business tax that you may have with, with IRAs, but in real life, we raise capital from individuals. And if the economy takes a turn or the, the banks or the, institutional investors that provide leverage decide they don't want to be in that space any longer. You're kind of left holding the bag. And if you have a portion of your fund leverage, they want their money back and you can't give it to them because let's face it, these funds are not liquid. They are, the money's invested. And if they want their money back now, what ends up happening is you have to pay them a, you know, a monthly, fee or interest and any income the fund makes goes to them until they're paid off. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, they could cause liquidity crisis for a fund. So yeah. that's exactly, yeah. So, so, it, so it can be very dangerous for fund operators to, to get le- uh, leverage on, on their funds. Now, you know, there, there's a good payoff, but it's, it's only as good as the creditors want to stay in that space. And, and as we all know, another shiny object will come up and they'll want to get into another space. <laughs> And there's nothing we can do about that. So you're better off just staying with uh, individual investors if possible. Right? Yeah, agreed. And, and this is back to, you mentioned the investment quadrant methodology. And I, you know, this is something I, I can't claim that I developed the quadrants concept is not new. The quadrants have existed for thousands of years. But methodology that I've developed with investment quadrants in real estate is a way to look at these deals. Look through the, the prism of these quadrants. And it helps folks understand what are they investing into? Are they investing in vehicles, into projects with good downside protection, with more conservative structure, or are they investing into more speculative, higher risk investments? And generally speaking, leverage is not a bad thing when you have conservative leverage at the low you know, LTV. And some of the value add projects in multifamily, they do have leverage. We're investing in an equity and the projects might have 70% loan, sometimes 75%. Generally speaking, with quality projects and significant value add, this is completely fine. The initial leverage is 75%, but all the renovations will actually take the project through the cycle where the leverage, the, the finishing leverage, maybe only 60% after the value add strategy. And it can be refinanced or could, can be sold. So good that long-term bank loans at low interest rates is a good leverage. So we, we are all for it. We just don't like over leveraged projects where the leverage gets really high, 85, 90%, basically hard money. And some people do use hard money, but those projects are called the speculative projects because of the high leverage puts them in a very speculative arena. And if they execute well, that's great. And if the the execution plan fails is where the problem is, the leverage can sink them. So that's the the basic methodology. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I'm not, discouraging leverage in most cases if and you're you're right as long as you're loan to value or you're doing a a low leverage point and, and i go back to the 2008 issue that we had the people that lost money and lost their homes were over leveraged most retail buyers that bought a home they're getting five percent down three percent down some of them had no money down and if the values dropped, it, they were underwater in their mortgage and they couldn't sell the house unless they brought uh, a check with them uh, to closing uh, to make up the difference. The people that bought homes as speculative investments, not based on cash flow, they just assumed the values would go up. Again, they over leveraged. 
but in most markets, now there's exceptions to that, the sand states, they had quite a bit of a drop in values, but mostly throughout the country, as long as you were at 75 to 70%, and I'm talking single family homes at this point, as long as you were at, at that rate or lower, you're, you were never underwater and you have a much better plan B exit strategy. And right now I encourage people to get uh, conventional bank financing on individual rental properties, as long as they keep it at 75% of the value or less, because you know, we have a window right now where you're in low fives, upper fours on 30 year terms for, you know, a rental property. And let's face it, 10 years down the road that you still got the same payment and you're paying it with dollars that are worth a heck of a lot less than it was uh, currently. <laughs> so you're paying back this, this money with uh, dollars that are worth less. So it really is a great hedge. You just got to be careful not to over leverage these properties, but there's great debt out there. I like to always go to the Dave, Dave Ramsey stuff. He's talking about never having any debt. And, and that's good for the masses because most of them really don't understand finance. But if I can make it a little bit more simpler, you don't finance stuff you want. You finance stuff that turns into an asset, not a debt, right? So you're creating an asset with leverage. You're not financing stuff that you just want and you think you need, but you don't really need it. You just want it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with you. There's a couple of comments on this, just to add some thoughts on, on the sure. subject. So for sure today, the interest rates are um, fairly low. And I am a proponent of the theory they're going to stay low for a long time. I'm not saying we're going to go completely to the Japan model, but it's unlikely that we're going to hit the days of high interest rates. The U.S. economy just can't afford it. So the government will do everything they can to keep the rates low. Sure. It comes down to fiscal irresponsibility and the politicians wanted to kick the can. So they, they borrow the money, growing national debt, unfunded liabilities. The bigger that thing gets, the, the more pressure there is to keep the rates lower. So the quantitative easing or whatever else they're going to do, they're going to keep doing it to keep the rates low. So why am I saying this? Well, if you get a 30-year fixed mortgage today, it is possible the rates will drop some. And you may be able to refinance a number of years from now, even at a lower rate. So that scenario is not a bad scenario at all. If you got good fixed rate today and you got something better tomorrow, great. Obviously, if somehow the rates move up, you, you have that protection mechanism. But then one key point about investing, and I just wanted to give this to the audience because it's a very simple, very powerful tool to think about it. So if you're getting a mortgage, at whatever interest rate, let's just say the rate is 4.5%. The big question is, is this, does the rates of appreciation in that area exceed the rate on the mortgage? So if the prices historically have appreciated in a given area by more than 4.5%, historically over the last 40 years, then you are ahead. No matter what you do, even if you have a mortgage, you're paying 4.5% to the bank, but the house is increasing in value, say at 5% a year, right? That alone is already creating positive uh, effect. On top of that, you're getting free cash flow. So the cash is the king. And if you can do well with the cash flow, even the value temporarily drops if market fluctuates, you can survive the, the downstorm. But this basic technique, uh, let me state it again interest rate on a mortgage versus the average rate of appreciation. So every trade of appreciation is higher than the interest rate on a mortgage, you're in good shape for long term. And if you're in those areas of the country where they don't appreciate very high, you have to make sure that you have a much higher cash flow to make up the difference, right? Exactly. That is a great point. If, yeah. if the appreciation is very low, two, three percent, and you're paying four and a half percent on the mortgage, you're pretty much cash your whole place for the cash flow. Right. Excellent. So Mike, your four quadrants, do you have that listed on your website at bigmikefund.com anywhere where people can see it and look at it? There's a number of educational presentations. So they go bigmikefund.com and they click corporate site and there's a number of educational or recorded educational webinars and, and Zoom calls where they can see the, these quadrants. One of these days I'll spin it out in a separate site, but for now, 
it's just literally under the education. If you go, the corporate website is templefunding.com. But if you go bigmikefund.com, click corporate, it'll take you to the uh, templefunding.com. Again, bigmikefund.com, click corporate, it'll take you to the templefunding.com, click education. You're gonna see a bunch of presentations that helps folks understand the quadrants. And, um, you know, you guys have been listening to this show. Uh, you know, the, the knowledge that Mike has, and uh, one of the great things about him is he's always willing to share that with folks. And that's one of the great things about him and the group in general that we hang out with. We're all about uh, giving as much knowledge as possible because, you know, the old saying that, uh, high tide lifts all the boats and we want, we want everyone to be successful that comes in contact with us. And, and we're happy to give this information out. Sharing is caring. We're trying to, um, we've done it all life, uh, trying to, to give and, and to help folks. Obviously, you know, be respectful of our time and happy to help folks. If you need detailed help, if you need more than just basic sort of education, I did launch BigMyCoaching.com, so it is part of it's actually listed on the site. It's focused on looking at your deals, helping folks. If you're looking to do a multifamily deal and you're trying to put together a syndication, or if you're looking to invest one into one and you don't know how to evaluate it, which seems to be a pretty serious issue nowadays. Mm -hmm. Folks look into funds, syndications. 99% of what's circulating out there, heavily promoted, is not good. Right. I mean, I mean this with all due respect. A lot of crappy deals are circulating. People don't understand this is a highly speculative deal and the investors taking all the risk and the sponsors are getting paid enormous fees to just take the deal down. And then if the deal succeeds, they make a giant, giant share of the return. So these type of deals are, 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 are terrible. And this, there's a few decent deals, funds like ours. I'm, I'm not trying to say we're the best thing of the sliced bread, but we certainly have very professional institutional waterfalls and we care for our investors. So investors come first. And the, the, again, we're not heavily promoted. That's the whole thing. The, the, the well established funds with good track records and good managers and just the sort of hidden gems, hidden secrets per se. And the stuff that's heavily promoted through social media and whatnot are generally not high quality because they need to make their fees and they need to promote and they're spending money on the promotion. So it's right. just a general concept. Yeah. If you're hearing about them on a satellite radio commercial, it's probably not a good deal. <laughs> <laughs> just think about this. They're paying fortunes to promote themselves, right? They got to charge all these fees to recover the money. That's the bottom line. And folks, keep in mind, we're not angelic by giving out all this information. We do have a ulterior motive as well is that an educated investor is a much easier investor for us to work with. So we would much rather have an educated investor knowing what they're getting into because it makes life so much easier for the fund manager, doesn't it? I agree. The best investor is the one that goes in investment with eyes wide open with significant experience and understanding. We have some very high net worth individuals who are very sophisticated. And the reason they invest with us is for the reason that we, we provide almost institutional level product of generally available only to high net worth individuals. And for sure, educated investor is much easier to communicate with, much easier to work with. And they ask smarter questions and we can get through the process of Q and A and help them out much faster than folks are just, you know, starting. Let me put it this way. Absolutely. Listen, I appreciate you giving us your time today. I, I know you, probably have another skating gig you have to go to. Not in the middle of the day when we're recording this, but in the evening, yes, I have to take one of my kids to the ice skating ring this evening for your usual practice. I appreciate the kindness and the invitation to be on the uh, on your podcast. We'd love to be of service to you and, and folks who are listening to the podcast. Excellent. So uh, again, it's bigmikefund.com and then there's tabs in there for some of the other uh, areas, the education and, and Mike does a a podcast as well and that's called big mike fun podcast gotcha. and i uh, let, let me correct a final joke yes. let me correct a final joke and then we'll wrap up so in this this came as a suggestion one of the other podcasts and, and I, I and they asked me what is the website how do you find you and i told them big mike fund.com what did they hear big mike fun.com <laughs>
And the moment I heard about this, I thought, boy, this has got to be an interesting site under that web name. And it, I happened to be lucky and grabbed that, uh, that website. So if you go there, I promise you're not going to find kinky content. So. <laughs> okay. You were smart enough to get what people think they hear, too. <laughs> that's, that's pretty funny. Next time, we're going to get a picture of the cat uh, while we're while we're yeah next next time she's somewhere roaming around the house so all right mike it, it was a pleasure thanks again for being on the show once again bigmikefun.com and then big mike fun podcast our information is on carolinahardmoney.com please like and share and again as i said the week before we have other content somewhere on the screen around it you'll see it it'll pop up all around so uh, till the next show, we'll see you later. Thank you very much for joining us. Hope you had a good time. Got a little knowledge as well. Don't forget to subscribe and like us. And if you like to see some more episodes, go over here, perhaps up here, or perhaps down here. But there's a place to press to get to the other episode. <laughs> Enjoy. Enjoy.